Shem Hashem Naseh V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, Bukhim Abayim, Shana Tova to everyone. We're uh, back in our uh, weekly shiurim. We're uh, going to continue our uh, series of the uh, Jewish Ashkafa. We're, um, Baruch Hashem, uh, moving uh, with this uh, series that uh, I know, it, at least for myself, has been life-changing, uh, understanding more and more what Da Torah uh, is, and uh, what, uh, what we are, where we need to be, Bezat Hashem. The uh, shul tonight, Bezat Hashem, will be for a refuah uh, shlema um, for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, David Ben Asriya, Doris Bat Jora, Orit Bat Ilana, Itro Ben Avraham, Talia Bat Sarah, and also for a atzlacha uh, raba, Me'alu Me'ever Ateva to uh, the, uh, our dear organization Be'ezat Hashem with all the major things that we have in, uh, in the works. Uh, of course, for the Aslacha Rabba, for our very dear uh, sponsor, uh, Marsha Bat Julie and uh, her uh, amazing family, Kadosh Baruch Yivarech Otam Bekomi Kol Kol, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, uh, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, May this year be the year that uh, all of the successes, uh, both uh, above and uh, below, will, uh, will, they will reach them and uh, the uh, family will be united once and for all, Bezad Hashem. Uh, also for a Atzlacha uh, Rabah for Shaul ben Farzane, Itro ben Avraham, uh, David ben Asriya, Oshri ben Doris, Gabi ben Doris, Elad ben Doris, um, Alex ben Noach. Uh, Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, uh, Amir Ben Shahin, um, uh, also Elad Ben Doris, uh, Ruben Chaim Ben Pala Parel, and Shaul Ben Farzane. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam Bikom Mikol Kol, Chaim Arukim, Shlemim, Meleim Torah, Mitzvot, Gminut Chasadim, Nachad Ubacha, to them, to all of the other wonderful sponsors and helpers and supporters and uh, viewers that uh, continue to uh, learn Torah with us week after week. Uh, for all of those that uh, missed out on the uh, nine-hour uh, shiur on Hoshana Rabbah, uh, from what I heard from the people that attended and uh, watched it online, it's not a shiur to be missed. Uh, there was an a, enormous amount of new material in that shiur. Well, there was a lot of siyat uh, and it's definitely worth watching, even if you uh, uh, most likely have to watch it in pieces. Uh, there's a lot of material uh, that uh, that came from that shiur. We'll probably uh, also cut the shiur to a few pieces to uh, specify certain things, but uh, uh, still, uh, I wouldn't uh, recommend waiting for that time. Uh, because there's just a lot of new material in that shiur that is uh, important for each and every one of us to know, uh, regardless of where uh, where you're at at this point. Now, over these uh, last uh, you know year or so that we've been doing this uh, series with the Chazonish, we've uh, time and again heard the Chazonish uh, let us know the importance of learning Allaha, the importance of learning Musar, and uh, most importantly, the, uh, the importance of understanding the necessity of uh, one for the other, meaning that a person can't just rely on their knowledge of uh, Musal in order to be a good person, and uh, a person can't rely on their knowledge of Alacha in order to be a righteous person, uh, simply because the two go with each other. You know, you can't have one without the other, and uh, uh, we've seen uh, you know, many times where people will uh, jump on the bandwagon of the uh, Alacha train, learn Alacha, and uh, they'll uh, take on you know whatever sefer they want, whether it's uh, Minhag Ashkenazi or Sfaradi, and start learning Alacha and, and, and become uh, the, uh, the first guy to uh, tell the rabbi that he's wrong anytime that he misses uh, something, or uh, the first guy to let everybody in the Kila know uh, anytime that it looks like they're missing something. First person, which, you know, perhaps is a, uh, uh, they think is a mitzvah, uh, and many times it's not, but uh, they won't know that because they haven't learned derech eretz, they haven't learned enough musar to know how to behave, when to say something, when not to say something, how to say it, and uh, most of the time I, I see that uh, even to simply ask a question, 
simply ask a rabbi a question most people don't know how to do it you know where they uh today with the media being what it is you know people uh you know like to uh get phone numbers of rabbis and simply spam all of them with their one question just to see what different rabbis will say about different things which is completely inappropriate uh it's a uh, it's against all uh, uh you know uh ways of behavior not just in the torah world but in, in every other aspect where if you for example would uh would have a uh uh let's say an investment in real estate that you wanted to invest in and uh you know you decide you know what let me go ask every single realtor uh in the market what does he think of this investment and you shout out you know 10 20 different emails to different realtors what they think and what could they tell you about this particular piece of real estate that you want to buy or you want to sell uh, of course everybody with common sense knows that that's not the appropriate behavior because each one of these realtors is not going to be answering you because of their good nature they're going to be answering you with an expectancy that uh, you're asking them not only because you value their opinion but perhaps because you also want to do business with them uh, so everybody understands that the same concept goes if you're going to ask you know people for investment advice in other places or marriage advice or anything else people understand this common sense that you don't just go spewing out your uh, your request for information from everybody and taking advantage of the uh, so-called free offer uh, but unfortunately in the rabbinical world this uh, seems to have missed uh, people's uh, uh, you know teachings where people just send out questions to everybody and just to see what everybody will uh, you know will answer them number one completely disregarding the the importance of the uh, Tomit Chacham's time and number two completely disregarding the uh, the understanding that to get a real answer from somebody requires that person to number one know who you are and number two even more importantly to make sure that you're going to be listening to this advice because if you're just gonna you know you're rabbi shopping obviously you're not looking for the truth you're just looking for someone's gonna give you what you already are predispositioned to do so uh unfortunately most people don't know how to ask questions and they ask a lot of questions to everybody they possibly can and after you've answered their question they tell you oh yeah but rabbi so-and-so said such and such people like that unfortunately uh it's it's very hard to help them and quite frankly it's uh, many rabbis uh, myself included uh get to a point where you simply don't want to answer those people's questions uh they uh, they waste your time they ruin it for everybody else and you usually just simply just ignore their questions after a while because you realize that they're not really looking for answers so if we don't know how to ask questions uh in this generation needless to say we don't know how to behave uh when we think we have the answer because sometimes you'll see somebody jump on the Musar train, start learning Musar, start learning about Yirat Shamaim, how you're supposed to be afraid of Hashem, how you're supposed to uh, make sure that uh, you, you think twice before you do something that's against Hashem. And many times you'll see people, you know, go on that train and start listening to different strong speakers, which unfortunately in English there aren't many. Uh, but nonetheless, they, uh, they do exist and uh, you see that people jump on the train but then when you ask them about their own uh, uh, personal behavior and how they serve Hashem uh, outside of the things that are easy for them, uh, you see that they don't even know the basics of the laws, whether it's the laws of Shabbat, the laws of marriage, uh, you know, where you'll see that a, a person doesn't even know that it's a mitzvah for him to buy his wife a present uh, for, uh, for the Chagim. He thinks that he's just being nice. A person doesn't even know that he has to put everything on hold on mikveh night. All of his appointments, all of his dealings have to be simply thrown into the garbage if it's going to interfere with mikveh night. A woman doesn't understand that if she does not want to go to the mikveh, then she might as well just get divorced because there's no marriage. Uh, you know, people don't understand these basics of things. Uh, or a person says, listen, she doesn't want to go to mikveh. I'm not going to uh, force her to do it. We're still going to be husband and wife, you know, with or without it. And they don't understand the magnitude of family purity, what it means, what it doesn't mean. And simply they decide that since they're decent people, according to the, uh, the shiurim that they've watched, the books that they've read, that talk about behavior, 
and they don't really know the laws, they figure they'll just take the law into their hands, whatever makes sense, since they are good people. And they decide that, you know what? We're not really ready to have a kid. We're just going to take the birth control pill. For how long? Eh, until we're ready. When are you going to be ready? Oh, until we have a nice nest egg in the bank. Until he gets another job. Until she gets this. Until she gets that. And uh, when we have uh, time. And they don't realize that these types of things are major halachic violations. That a person can simply destroy their entire world. Not just in this world, but their olam haba with that type of behavior. But people simply assume that just because they know a little bit of Musar, of what not to do and how to be afraid of what happens after life, that it's okay, then that means I also know, I I know Da Torah. I know the opinion of a Torah because I learned Musar. And there's nothing further from the truth. The two have to go together. If you're going to learn Alakha, you have to make sure that that Alakha is... uh, combined with Musar. If you're going to learn Musar, you have to combine it with Alakha. And if you think that those two are enough, you're mistaken again. Why? Because if you're a man, you also have to learn the weekly parasha. You have to learn the weekly parasha to make sure that you are covering what the Shulchan Aruch says is an obligation. You have to follow each weekly parasha, read it once, uh, with a uh, 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 twice with... Um, uh, without commentary and once with commentary and ideally learn it with the commentary of Onkelos. But if uh, you don't have Onkelos available to you, then Rashi will suffice. But uh, nonetheless, one of the uh, great things that, uh, great ideas that I uh, heard uh, recently that uh, Rav Meir Eliyahu says that it's a very good idea for a person that already covered uh, what he needs to do, meaning that he's already at a point, he's advanced, he has, uh, you know, he easily learns Torah several hours every single day. He learns his, uh, you know, his Gemara. He learns Tuchan Aruch. He learns everything, but he wants to become more of an expert in the actual five books of Moses because everybody understands you cannot even get a chance of becoming a Talmud Chacham without becoming an expert in the Chumash. So, but how do you become an expert in the Chumash if you keep reading Rashi every single year? Well, you become an expert because there are other mefarshim, there are other commentaries. So what is the suggestion? The suggestion is every year to take on the commentary of another sage. So you start off with Rashi, and then you, uh, and you have your obligation, either Rashi or Onkelos, and you have obviously you want to go advanced, you, you've completed those already a few times. Okay, add the Ramban, add the, uh, the, the other commentaries, whether it's the... Uh, uh, the Midrash Gadol, or the uh, you have uh, the Malbim, or you have uh, the Al Sheikh, and you have countless commentaries on the uh, uh, on the um, uh, Chumash that will complete the picture in your mind much much more than you can imagine. Because a lot of times when you say certain things in Shulim, people say, "Oh wow, that's a Chidush," but in reality, it's basic commentary by Rashi or one of the other sages that they could have seen themselves if they weren't so spiritually lazy. Now, of course, not everybody has the time to learn Torah all day and all night, and we're not necessarily expecting people to learn Torah all day and all night. But the reality is that every person needs to know that if they want to serve Hashem appropriately, they have to make time to learn Torah each and every single day. There's simply no other way around it. And in this generation, Hashem made it much easier to learn Torah by making the Torah available to you in different formats, not just in books. You have videos, you have audios, you have the Bezat Hashem app, you have, uh, you have it uh, in, different, in movie format. You have it in so many different ways that you can learn different parts of the Torah that uh, Baruch Hashem, and it's available in multiple languages. So there's an endless amount of ways that you can learn Torah, which leaves us really no excuse. But to say that a person is going to uh, become a Talmud Chacham by simply listening to uh, or, or, or reading one aspect of the Torah, surely that person is mistaken. And I've seen it many times in this uh, last year where we had this uh, epidemic, and uh, I'm not even referring to the epidemic of Corona, but rather the epidemic of foolishness that we've had of people fighting over the vaccine fighting over the virus which we've discussed extensively already in a couple of lectures but you see how people simply have thrown their olamaba into the garbage pail by how 
they express their opinion, their thoughts publicly against the Gdole Adol, against the you know, big rabbis, against even kosher Jews. And many times they simply just throw their Olam Abba into the garbage because they feel the need to express their opinion, whichever way it is. And it's sad to see it because if that person would have learned Alacha of how to treat a Talmud Chacham, or learn Allah of how to express their opinion even, the laws of Lashon Ara, the laws of, of Rechilut, all of these different things, they would have known that it's simply better 99% of the time to just be quiet. To just be quiet. But for whatever reason or another, they decided that they're going to uh, uh, you know, express their opinion. Or if they heard a uh, speaker say something, whether it's to do something or to not do something, they simply decided that okay if he says to do it or he says not to do it that's it i'm not going to double check i'm not going to ask my rabbi i'm simply going to do it and they be, all of a sudden they became parrots all of a sudden they became parrots they listened to it like it's torah mi sinai so again it's important for a person to have a rabbi it's important for a person to you know be uh, receptive to uh, to the Torah, but also it's important for a person to use their brain and realize that there are certain times that if the law is clear, no problem. It's a yes, it's a no, you go do what you have to do. But if the law is not clear, or if something is a little bit uh, 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 gray, then you have to double check certain things. And you can't just blindly assume that whatever you're hearing is 100%. Because sometimes you'll see certain people speak out and they'll make a mistake and they'll retract but if you're not watching every one of their speeches if you're not following every one of their newsletters sometimes you'll see that uh you're you're not aware you're not aware of uh of their corrections so it's important for a person to know that if you're going to be living a righteous life a life that is that hashem wants you to live whether it's life of a jew or a life of a noahide you have to make sure that you are following what is called da torah the opinion of a torah one of the things that i can give you that's coming up to my head and if it comes to my head just like Rav Shpadron, Alava Shalom, uh, used to say if you have a whole plan of whatever lecture you're going to have but something comes up to your head you have to say it why because of course hashem is sending you messages to say it i'll tell you this there used to be this uh this uh speaker rabbi that uh catered to the uh noahides of the world him and another guy they uh they uh, put a book together and they uh they called it uh something about the girl uh and they uh in essence put you know they wrote a lot of different things in this book catering to the noahides and one of the things that they uh, wrote in this book that was a complete so-called chidush new insight that no one's ever heard of before uh is which is not common especially when it comes to uh things that are relatively basics uh is that they said that the noahides should keep shabbat just like the jews do based on the understanding of one of the uh one of the people and the other one agreed with them and they pushed this whole shabbat being observed by non-jews now of course people that uh want to live a jewish life without actually being jewish for different reasons love this whole thing and jumped on the bandwagon and started keeping shabbat as if they're jews now why was this such a chidush because the sages like the rambam from uh, 900 years ago and many others that have discussed this said it's completely forbidden for a non-jew to keep shabbat in fact it's considered stealing where at the time of the sanhedrin there would be a uh, uh, a death penalty from heaven for such a thing uh, because shabbat is specifically a uh, gift that hashem gave to am israel he did not give it to the goyim this is the reason why uh, in during the kiddush of shabbat when you say kiddush of shabbat HaKadosh, we're reciting a verse from the torah Part of it is a uh, things from Sefer Bereshit, which we uh, just uh, started again, and some of it is uh, during the uh, uh, Prophet Isaiah and other places. We say Hashem says this is a gift, a gift that He's giving us. It's a covenant between us and Him. It's not Hashem and all of mankind, but rather Hashem and the Jewish people. So when these two guys came out and said, "Listen, all the non-Jews can keep Shabbat," 
in essence, this was a you know perhaps a, a good money maker for them maybe, uh, but it wasn't the right da'at Torah. Now, of course, this is uh, for some people say yeah, but this has already happened a long time ago. It's water under the bridge. Perhaps it's water under the bridge for all of those that know the end of that story, but it's not water under the bridge for those who don't know the end of the story, which is that one of the uh, rabbis left the rabbinical world altogether. I think he became an exercise guru or something like that. And the other one, I'm not sure if he's still teaching or not, but he did retract uh, his, uh, his uh, statement that uh, non-Jews should keep Shabbat, and uh, he said that he made a mistake. Now, to go find that retractment is not very easy, at least not anywhere near as easy as it is to find his uh, videos about him saying to keep Shabbat. But the reality is that that's what the case is. So a person needs to understand that whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you are responsible for your own life. And uh, the, uh, the, the problem that many people have is that they start somewhere they get some type of motivation to uh you know from you know that Hashem is is in essence inspiring them to get closer to him whether it's through uh fear of heaven or whether it's through chasidut or whether it's through Allah whatever the case may be and then they just simply park where they start off they start off running but then they just figure you know what I don't need to run anymore I could just walk and they just you know walk along and they forget that they're still living in a world of lies where since they haven't really completely uh consumed all of the knowledge that's necessary they're still technically living in between lies and truth and you can have people living in this uh limbo for 20 years where they'll feel religious but in reality they have no share of the world to come they feel religious, but in reality, they're going to Genom and they're not coming out. Or at the very le- least, let's say at the best case scenario, they're going to Genom for a long time. Why? Because they still have some sins that they're committing on a regular basis, either because they have no knowledge that these things are so bad, or because they don't realize the magnitude of the sin. You know, where sometimes you'll see some people say, listen, I know that such and such is not allowed, but Hashem knows that I can't handle it and he'll understand me. And they simply just assume that Hashem is going to understand them and accept them the way they are. Now, of course, a person under, you know, knows that this is not true. So how do they reason this? How do they get to the point of arriving at such falsehood, but they make it into the truth? How did they do such a thing? The Chafetz Chaim once said that if you ever see a person take a bunch of money and gold and diamonds and all types of things. You see him and he's throwing them all in the street. Just, he has a whole thing, he has a truck, it's full of stuff, and he just takes the money and he throws it out. Takes the gold, throws it out. Takes the jewels, throws it out, throws it out. Now, from afar, there's no way for you to know why he's doing what he's doing. No way for you to know. But one thing you can know for sure is that those jewels that gold that money it's not his why because if it was his he wouldn't be throwing it out many times you see these false speakers that we mention and the ones that we don't mention the ones that are 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 causing damage to the masses and the ones that are causing damage to the locals you see them taking the torah and just throwing it in the garbage you know Tell people, listen, there's no judgment. Hashem loves everybody. Everybody's going to heaven. And you see people follow suit and say, yeah, Hashem's not going to judge me. He understands everybody. I continue driving on Shabbat to Bet Knesset. It's not a real problem. I continue stealing in my business. It's not a problem. In essence, just taking the entire Torah and just throwing it in the garbage, taking the diamonds of the Torah that we learn in each parasha, that we learn in each sefer, and just throw it in the garbage. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing. We don't know why Manus decided to go crazy over the last 12 years and just become a complete apicots. We don't really know why uh, Meza decided to become a complete apicots. We don't know why Drog and all of the other heretics decided to do what they're doing. But one thing we do know for sure is that the Torah is not theirs. The Torah is not theirs. They didn't delve into it deep enough to make it theirs. They didn't 
get to a point where they really fall in love with the Torah itself. They have perhaps a few tidbits from here, a few tidbits from there, just enough to make them dangerous, and that's it. And their followers, you can't feel bad for them. Why? The Gemara says you cannot be merciful on a wicked person. Can't be merciful. You can help him do tshuva, but you can't be merciful for him. Why? He is wicked because he chooses to be, not because he's just a victim. There is no such thing as victims. Everybody chooses what they're going to be. No one is going to live an entire life without Hashem sending them countless messages to do tshuva. Nobody. Jew or Gentile. Black, white, green, burgundy in Manipur, in, a, in a, uh, California, in Australia, in Israel. Nobody lives an entire life without Hashem sending them countless messages to do tshuva with the one and only Torah. Nobody. Everybody gets their chance or chances throughout their life so when they choose to live a wicked life stealing their business cheat on their husbands and wives uh lie do do all types of immoral things there's nothing that's a uh they're not victims they're choosing to do this now if they tell yeah but i listened to manis and dennis and this one and that one yeah exactly you were looking for a lie hashem provided you the lie you're not a victim you chose it and the reason why you fell for it is because it was simply soothing the lie that you wanted to live to begin with. You didn't want to own the Torah. You didn't want to delve into it. You didn't want to toil into it. You didn't want to make the Torah yours. You just wanted somebody to hand you a certificate to tell you you're allowed to sin. You're allowed to live an immoral life. You're allowed to cheat and lie. You're allowed to do whatever you want. And that's in essence what you got. So the reality is, Rabotai, is that when you see people throwing the Torah in the garbage it's only because they don't own it it's not theirs they don't even realize it's a diamond sometimes and that's the problem so that's in essence what the chazonish has been trying to tell us over these last year about when he was teaching us initially about emuna and what it really is when he was teaching us about bitachon and what it really is now he's been teaching us about yirat shamayim how we have to fear heaven and also how we have to learn Allah and how we have to combine the two because one without the other you're never going to arrive at the truth now we're going into the uh 24th section of the third chapter and he and he says the following this is a section that we read previously but we'll follow up since it's been a while we'll delve into it a little deeper this time around and we'll go into a further section that we did not go into last time chazoni says indeed the glory of a person learned in alacha is not justified unless his wisdom is preceded by fear of heaven Torah wisdom cannot exist in a senseless heart for the principal grasp of it lies in the refinement of the soul as it rises above the desires of mortal human beings and roams through the higher worlds tasting the flavor of the desire for the source of wisdom craving for endless understanding delighting in wisdom feeling rupturous so here the chazunish gives us a little bit of understanding of where we're really supposed to get to first and foremost you have to get to the understanding of what does the truth look like because sometimes a person can swear they have the truth but they don't even know what it looks like if it hit them in the face so first and foremost he clarifies the following he says it's amazing amazing to be a person that's learned on alacha you learn a bunch of alacha books and you feel good about it okay before you start jumping and doing the uh, uh, some uh, song and dance to celebrate your uh, your uh, your stature, you have to understand that your knowledge of halacha is not real knowledge. In fact, you cannot even rely on it unless it was preceded by fear of heaven, meaning that reshit yirat Hashem. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of Hashem, says Shlomo Melech. 
that if you did not learn to fear the Almighty, whether it's the beginning of fear, which is fear the Almighty and it's punishing you, going to Genom, going to Kafakela, which we discussed in our nine hour Shior on Oshan Araba, uh, Kever, which uh, the movie came out about uh, you know two months ago and is scaring a lot of people into reality and understanding of where what's going to happen at one point for anybody that is simply going to live in this world if they don't do tshuva. Now, if you don't, if you don't even know these things exist, you don't know what genome is. You think that everybody goes to heaven, everything is fine and dandy. You don't think that uh, there's punishment. You think that everything is great. You have no fear of the Almighty. Guess what? Not only can you not rely on the Allah knowledge that you have, but even more so, even more so, you have to understand that the Allah knowledge that you have is not going to be enough to stop you from sinning the big sins. Why? Because you have nothing holding you, nothing holding you from simply losing control and just not following the Allah that you actually know and that's unfortunately one of the things that people do not understand they understand it in real life that they operate in whether it's work or it's their marriage or and so on people know that you know they should not cheat and lie and and do all types of things that are a violation of a relationship, whether the relationship is with a, with a spouse or with the government or an employer, they know that if they get caught stealing, they get caught cheating, they're going to get fired. They could potentially go to jail. They could uh, lose their spouse. Everybody understands this. Everybody understands that there is a consequence for the violation. Still, unfortunately, they, uh, uh, they still violate either way. Part of the reason is because they think that everybody's stupid and they're not going to get caught. Another part is because their desire is simply a lot bigger than their, uh, their understanding of the ramification for fulfilling that desire and getting caught for doing so. But when truth, you know, when, when the bottom line is, is that most people simply don't do the right amount of calculation to understand the consequences. Meaning that he understands that if his wife catches him cheating on her, that she's probably going to get angry. And not only angry, she's probably going to leave him. Now, he understands this. If you tell him, listen, are you going to tell your wife about your girlfriend? No, are you crazy? Uh, of course not. Why not? Well, because she'll leave me. Okay, so you understand that she could leave you, right? But you're still doing it. Why? Because you didn't really do the full calculation because your brain is not operating the right way. You're thinking in a different way. You're thinking about fulfilling a momentary desire. You're not thinking about the fact that your wife is the one that was there for you through thick and thin. Your wife is the one that gave you children. Your children are going to feel betrayed by you. They're not going to want to see you. They're never going to forgive you. And even more so, your kids are never going to grow up the same. They're going to be the kids of the father that cheated on the mother. And they're going to be forever known as those person, as those people that their father cheated on the mother or the mother cheated on the father. And even more so, you automatically make your kids much more prone to divorce in their own lives when they get older because once a child sees that marriage is just a temporary thing as long as it doesn't get in the way of, uh, of uh, fulfilling desires then the kid knows what to do himself because that's just the kid's best teacher uh, is is their parents so what ends up happening is that kids that come from broken houses tend to be people that end up uh, you know breaking another house themselves of course Everybody can break the trend, and uh, with with tshuva, everyone can break the trend. But the reality is that the person that started that original cheating, that original lying, is not thinking about all the damage and the embarrassment that he's going to cause someone that says I love you to him, someone that cooks for him, someone that cleaned for him, someone that was there for him when he was crying and lonely, someone that brought you know brought him kids to the life, someone that did all these. He's not thinking about any of those things. He's simply thinking about fulfilling a desire. He's not thinking about how his kids are going to be made fun of or people are going to look at them funny. He's not thinking about the fact that a few moments after he fulfills his desires with this excuse of a human being, what's going to end up happening? Nothing. 
Nothing's going to happen. He's, he's simply going to regret the second he did it. He's not thinking about all those things. He's not thinking about the ramifications of the uh, of, of his actions. And the same concept goes when a person is cheating in taxes or is cheating the government in some other ways. He simply thinks the government is stupid. They're never going to catch him. They're never going to know. They're never this. But he's not thinking one day they're going to open up FBI. Open up police. He's never thinking that at 5 o'clock in the morning. He never thinks that that's going to happen to him. He, he just thinks that happens in movies. They're not going to catch me. I'm only cheating small amount, chump change, 100, 200, 500,000 dollars. The government has better things to do than to go after little people like me. He doesn't think that the government is going to go break down his door and his entire family is going to be on the news, being embarrassed, being shamed. No one's ever going to look at them the same. No one's ever going to do business with them. No one's going to want to marry them. He's not thinking that way. He's not thinking that forever more he's going to be known as a criminal. He's not thinking that way. The wife that's benefiting from it, she's not thinking, listen, yeah, my husband is doing whatever he can to help us. She's not thinking, yeah, one day, whatever he's doing to help you is going to get you and potentially him also, or him and potentially you too, uh, you know, in cuffs, going out outside in front of the entire neighborhood, and everybody's going to see you on the news, and it's going to be on YouTube, it's going to be on everywhere. They're not thinking that way. They're not thinking that they're going to have to spend a few years behind bars where their best friend is some guy named Baba. They're not thinking that way. Why? Because they're thinking about the momentary pleasure. The momentary pleasure. They're not thinking about the consequence. Even more so, when a person cheats on their job, he is getting paid to do a certain job. She's getting paid to do a certain job. Instead of doing that job, they're going to lunch, they're going and cooking. They're going and hanging out. Yeah, but aren't you supposed to be working today? Ah, my boss doesn't know. He doesn't care. He's got so many employees, so many things to do. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Oh, you mean he doesn't care? You're not working for two, three, four hours straight, two, three, four days straight. He doesn't care? No, no, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Next thing you know, they're using the company property whenever they feel like it, like it's their money. Before you know it, they're doing whatever they want to do on company time taking vacation on company time and everything. Ah, nobody cares, nobody cares. They're not thinking about the fact that that company is working really hard and a lot of other people working really hard just to come up with that paycheck to pay you. They're not thinking about the fact that they're ungrateful. They're not thinking about the fact that they're going to get fired one day and no one's going to want to hire them. They're not thinking about the fact that all of their the fellow uh, co-workers they have are going to find out, oh, you see Jack? Yeah, that's the thief. That's the guy that was going out to lunch all the time, but nobody ever said something. Apparently somebody said something one day because the boss just fired him. And it's going to be the story of the company and everyone's going to share this Lashon Ara with their spouses. It's going to be all over the place. It may not be on the news quite, perhaps, hopefully not, but nonetheless, it's still going to be the news for a lot of people. And he's not thinking about it when he's cheating the company. She's not thinking about it when she's cheating the company. Why? Because they're thinking about the momentary pleasure. So that's in essence when people do, they know that these things are not good. They know cheating is not good. They know lying is not good. They know taking people, taking advantage of people is not good. Everybody knows this. Everybody. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Everybody knows, but yet they still do it. They're still criminals. It's just a reality. And today, and I'm telling you after over 20 years of business experience, over 20 years of business experience, I have yet to find one honest business person that I've dealt with. And I've dealt with thousands of people, thousands of people. A single person that's consistently honest, I have yet to find. People literally have become naturally inclined to be criminals in one way or another. Either they promise or they overpromise and underdeliver, or they promise and simply don't deliver at all, or they just simply cheat outright. One way or another, people simply have become, by default, criminals in one way or another. You hire somebody, they don't have the qualifications they told you. You, uh, you tell somebody to uh, as a contractor for something, they don't finish the job. Whatever it is, everybody's constantly selling lemons. It's expression for people that are selling things that are not good, even though lemons are relatively delicious. The reality is, is that people have become naturally inclined to be criminals everywhere so much so that there's even television shows about it actually talking about how great it is to be a criminal 
It's unbelievable. People admire the criminals, thereby becoming criminals, and they give it nice names like hustling. It's not hustling. You're a thief. That's what it is. You're not a hustler. You're a thief. But nobody likes to call themselves a thief or their best friend a thief or their spouse a thief. And nobody wants that. But that's the reality. Reality is people have become thieves by default. And they know it's wrong, but they still do it. Why? They simply do not think about the consequences. The fact that you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. The fact that the person that's paying you is working really, really hard to get you that money and you're not delivering what you promised. The fact that you're not thinking about how many people you're hurting and how many people are going to get hurt later on from what you're doing. Not thinking. So if people are not thinking about their actions in the world that they dedicate all of their time to, needless to say, they're not thinking about the world of eternity which they're not dedicating any time to and that's just the reality this is one of the things that a person you know has to understand this is why your brother your cousin your mother your father whoever it is in your family that is not afraid of Hashem that is not Torah observant that is not a hundred percent Haredi that's the reason that is the reason They simply do not understand the consequence of their actions. Not just in Torah and eternity, but even in their own day-to-day life. And there is no way that they've ever thought about what makes me good. Because everybody thinks that they're good. So what actually makes me good? Now if you say, oh, I don't steal. That doesn't make you good. That just doesn't make you a thief. Oh, well, I don't kill anybody. What the... Not killing anybody doesn't make you good. It just doesn't make you a murderer. Perhaps if you had the opportunity to murder somebody for a billion dollars, maybe you would become a murderer and a happy one too. The reality is that not performing a certain crime doesn't make a person good. And truth is, no one can answer the question of what makes them good without even knowing what good is. You can say, oh yeah, but I help people. Who do you help? Oh, I help my friends, I help my family. Well, what about the people that you don't know? Well, no, I don't help them. I just help the people that I, that, that I care for. Okay, well, so why does that make you good? Maybe you're doing it because you feel bad, you know, that uh, your uh, brother doesn't have as much as you. So in order to appease your own conscience, you're helping your brother. So in reality, you're not really helping your brother, you're helping yourself. Helping a stranger is a different story. Oh, no, no, so I do help a lot of strangers. Oh, so why do you help the strangers? Because maybe because you're getting a lot of business as a result of publicizing that you're helping strangers. So when a person really starts delving into their own actions and start questioning their own actions, they realize that without Torah, you don't even know the definition of good. Needless to say, you don't know how to be good. And when people don't evaluate the consequence of their actions, both the good and the bad consequences, the ramifications of their actions, they simply live a life that is just a free-for-all. And by the time they realize that they've ruined their life, that their life is just simply broken, it's usually after a lot of damages happen. I can't say it's too late because uh, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives people more than one chance. But many people don't take advantage of that chance. People that get into married, they know that they're not supposed to marry someone that's not Jewish if they're Jewish. They know, but they simply do it anyway. Why? Figure, listen, I love her, she loves me, he loves me, everybody loves each other. Yeah, but you do realize that intermarriage doesn't work one way or the other. It works today because there's a lot of lust involved, but that lust is not going to last. Give it a couple of years, you'll see how much you regret that decision, and you see all of the intermarriages end up becoming a disaster. Divorce, cheating, uh, all types of horrible things happen. All of a sudden, 15, 20 years after marriage, she suddenly cares that you're not of the same religion. All of a sudden, she wants to become religious to idolatry and you uh, you want to you know, become more religious Jew. A lot of problems happen. And, and the reality is you knew it all along, but you weren't thinking. You weren't thinking completely you were thinking just momentary momentary and this is one of the things that 
the Chazunish is trying to help us, help us understand before we take our first step into this new year, before we take that first step into the new year, before we continue going on a wrong path, before we continue living an illusion, thinking that we can continue living between the lies and the truth. He's telling us, listen, whatever knowledge you have of the law, if it's not coupled with fear of the Almighty, you can't even rely on that knowledge. Why? That knowledge will not stop you from violating the information you know. Why? You know you're not allowed to desecrate Shabbat. But if you don't know that by desecrating Shabbat or by not putting on tefillin, you're going to get a very serious judgment, what's going to stop you? If you ask most people, oh, what do you think uh, is good about, let's say, Chabad? Chabad, great, big chasidut, it's all over the place. Unfortunately, a lot of bad news from there also, but nonetheless, surely people know them for the good things they do. Every Friday, many of their kilod bring a lot of people to eat. They have people on the streets, uh, you know, putting on tefillin of people, right? So you ask the average Chabadnik, or you ask the average people that follow Chabad, what do you uh, know about Chabad? They'll tell you one of these things, and most notably they'll tell you, oh, you know, I like the fact that the Chabad guy comes every once in a while, and he puts on tefillin on, uh, on me. Okay, great. Did the Chabad guy ever tell you maybe you should get your own tefillin? No, not usually. Or when he did, I told him, nah, I don't feel like buying it. I don't, want, I don't feel like spending a thousand bucks. And he said, okay, no problem. I'll just keep coming once a week. And as if it was no big deal. Why? Because every Jew is precious, he said. Every, Hashem understands everybody. Hashem knows. Now, that Chabadnik knows that there's an obligation to put on tefillin. Hence the reason why the Rebbe the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, sent his soldiers all over the world to go put on tefillin on the people. So they know that there's an alacha, a Torah obligation for a Jew to put on tefillin. Everybody knows this. The religious Jew, the non-religious Jew. Everyone knows there's an obligation to put on tefillin. But yet, with all of that knowledge and all of those soldiers putting on tefillin, nobody really knows the consequences of not putting on tefillin. Not a single one of them. Why? Because if somebody says, I don't have tefillin, so okay, so well, I'll come once in a while and I'll put a tefillin on you. Okay, great. So what about the rest of the week? Eh, no big deal. You know, I'll come. Whenever I get a chance, if you ever want to get one, let me know, I'll sell it to you. So does that, that, in essence, gives them the license to just simply not do it until you come, meaning... They've transferred the responsibility of putting on tefillin on that messenger, on that chassid that comes to their office or their street every so often. What's the problem? The problem is that the Gemara doesn't agree with such a thing. Why? Because the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, in page 17a, says that a Jew that doesn't put on tefillin is going to go to Genom and never come out. He's one of those people that is considered as if he is completely disregarding Hashem in all aspects to the extent where he's desecrating Hashem's name on a regular basis by not putting on tefillin and he's going to get a permanent punishment until his soul is destroyed. Now you're going to say, yeah, no, no, but he did put on tefillin once a week, once a month. Okay, so you realize that he's going to get a very, very severe punishment for every time he didn't. A punishment that will make the Holocaust look like a child's play. Do you know that? Do you know that every time you miss tefillin, you're going to get punished severely for it? Oh, I thought it's just a good thing to do. Yeah, it is a good thing to do, but it's also a terrible thing not to do. And unless you knew the Musar aspect of it, which is the ramifications of not following the law, knowledge of the law, meaning the fact that you need to do it and obligate to do it was not sufficient this is just a small small example of how knowing the law is not enough same thing with shabbat person said no i need to keep shabbat i need to keep yom kippur i need to keep pesach but if something uh, a delicious sin comes my way unless i know the price of that sin Most likely the knowledge of that uh, law is not enough, not enough 
to keep me away from sins. So that's why the Chachamim already say in the Mishnah, in Avot, the same exact thing what the Chazoni says, that if a person wants to have his Chochmah last, it has to be preceded by fear of heaven. Now, unfortunately, there are certain people that have a what's called a Lev Atum, Lev Atum, closed heart, senseless heart. The Gemara says there's something called a Tumtum, What's a tumtum? It's a shemirachem. It's a person that's born that their uh, private area is shut. So you don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. You don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. It's shut. Shemishmov yatzin. It's tumtum. Complete. Shut off. Of course, some of these, you know, you have to have a surgery. It's a a, uh, a tragedy and a half. But nonetheless, there are people like this born. Sometimes... A person like this could be born, but still you operate on them and they can live a prosperous life and they could be a very good, uh, a very good situation. But a person that has a closed heart, a senseless heart, a heart that doesn't feel the need to do tshuva, the need to improve themselves, the need to evaluate the consequence of their actions. A person like this is literally almost like a lost cause. Why? They can live their whole life being completely close to any truth to the extent where even if the truth hit them in the face they say ah that's just his opinion ah it's not for me ah ah and all types of other expressions simply close to the truth and as the Zohar Kadosh says a person that you rebuke with something that's relevant to them with the truth that's relevant to them and not only they reject that rebuke, rejecting that bu- rebuke is relatively natural. Nobody likes to be rebuked. But not only they reject that rebuke, but they become your enemy. That's already a, uh, a, a evidence that this person, it's a stamp even. A stamp that that person is a wicked person. Now, does that mean they're a lost cause? No. You could still help them, but it's a lot more difficult than helping somebody just simply ignorant. So the Chazoni says that there are certain people that have a senseless heart and these people simply wisdom cannot exist in them why he knows a lot of books he reads a lot of books he even knows torah books he even wrote a book that has to do with torah he tells you about the different stories and so on and so forth yeah he could write a book he could read a book he could even tell you different things but real torah knowledge he does not have Rav Shach, Allah Shalom, used to say, I've never met a single person, a single person that has real knowledge of how to learn Torah if he doesn't have Yilat Shemayim. You say, but Rabbi, you've seen thousands of people. I mean, a lot of these people, you know, people tell me, Chachamim. So you have experience. So you're telling me you've never seen someone that's tell me, Chacham knows a lot of Torah, but he has no Yilat Shemayim. So he's not a real Tamit Chacham. So yeah, but he has a lot of Torah knowledge because he doesn't know how to learn. He knows a little bit of this, a little bit of that. He knows how to talk. He knows how to present it. But really, how to learn Torah, he doesn't know. Why? To really know how to toil in Torah requires a certain type of ingredient called Yirat Shemaim, fear of the Almighty. If you don't have that ingredient, simply, whatever Torah knowledge you have, it's like uh, Pavlov's dog. Every time you ring the bell, he starts to salivate because he expects the food. No different. No different. Same thing with people that train their body to do certain things when they're playing all types of sports. Their body is not supposed to operate that way, but they train their body to operate that way. Same concept. This person trained himself to know certain things, to have certain knowledge about certain things, but real knowledge of how to delve in, toil into Torah, how to arrive at the truth, how to get to the bottom line, he has no concept. He has no concept, she has no concept, if they do not have fear of the Almighty. Now, what's required to have this? Adinut nefesh, refinement of the soul. Really, it's Adinut nefesh, is softening of the soul. Softening of the body, where a person... As they learn more and more Torah, and of course, by Torah I mean they learn what the truth is as far as the halacha, they learn Musar and how to behave, 
naturally that softens the person what does it mean softens a person they become some pushover everybody everybody uh, just makes fun of them and pushes them over no because of course anyone that has read some of the stories about the sages when they had to deal with people that were heretics people that were against the Torah they were fire and brimstone all the way so and these people knew Torah to, to no end so Adinut Nefesh doesn't mean a person becomes so soft that you just push them over but rather when a person becomes a bigger and bigger Talmud Chacham that means that they're spending more and more time completely focused on Hashem now the Gemara says a Talmud Chacham doesn't work, walk doesn't walk four amot four amot is six to eight feet doesn't walk four amot without thinking about divrei torah how long does it take you to walk six to eight feet i don't know two three seconds a real tamit chacham doesn't spend two three seconds without thinking about hashem that's a real tamit chacham the gemara says so now when your person is thinking about hashem think about the moments that you've thought about hashem not just oh hashem exists but you thought hashem exists and he gave me the air and he's the one this and he's the one that and thank you Hashem he gave me food and thank you Hashem he gave me my wife my husband did that all these different times that you're praying or you're learning and you're getting closer to Hashem a Talmud Chacham is supposed to in essence think about this all the time so but when you're thinking about it you're much more receptive to different things that are going to come to you when you're learning Chumash when you're learning Gemara when you're learning different things you're looking for more things meaning that you're becoming more sensitive of the things that are around you that have to do with what with with Hashem so when a person is more and more uh, uh, cleaving to Hashem more and more glued to Hashem they are at that focus more and more time to the extent where it can literally become all the time all the time they're thinking about Hashem now because they're so focused all the time and their senses are open to more all the time they're much more sensitive to the stuff that's around them all the time which means that if there is more miracles good things uh blessings teachings they're more sensitive to it they absorb more of it you can look at a page they look at a page you see a bunch of words they see a whole world of new insights on the other hand you can walk in the street and just go through the market focusing on the tomatoes you need to buy but the Talmud Chacham that's walking next to you is shocked to the point of not even understanding what to do with himself why because he's not thinking about tomatoes anymore he's thinking about how these people are yelling at each other he's thinking about how this guy just punched the other guy and this guy's cursing and this guy's yelling and he's sensitive to all of it and when he sees all these things because he's so sensitive to all of it it affects them more even more so when a Talmud Chacham learns about the issues of genom about kafakela all of these hard things it's very common for them to start shaking and crying whereas a new baal tshuva a, a new person in the Torah or a person even has been religious their whole life but is new to these teachings they'll hear about genom they'll hear about kafakela they'll hear about these different things oh wow that's scary Psh, wow hope that doesn't happen to me that's it I have some people that I know where they'll tell me, listen, Rabbi, I watched your Ganom Shio like 10 times. I say to myself, how? How did you do it? Saying it was hard enough for me. Saying the Shio was hard enough for me. When I was studying for it, I was crying. How are you watching it 10 times? You don't be you don't pass out. Difference. Difference. What is the difference? they're in their early stages I advanced a little bit further so I've become a little more sensitive than they are people think oh just because you're talking about these difficult things this genome this punishment oh that means you're pretty much desensitized opposite it's up it's because you're sensitive is why you're crying out these things to try to warn people about these things in essence it's much more difficult to teach them 
much more difficult to teach them than it is to receive them at first why because the person that's receiving them for the first time they're pretty much closed it's like a scary movie okay scary movie and two seconds later you forgot about the scary movie you're happy go lucky again a person can watch the Tikuna Brit film the Chibuta Kevil film and the Ganom Shio one after the other a day later they're already sinning with a uh, non-Jew a day later they get back to steal it's just a reality it can happen it's not common but it can happen it can happen why some people are just atumim they're just closed or they have this klipa on them that's so thick that makes them very very not sensitive very not sensitive the tamit chacham the more of a tamit chacham the more sensitive they are to certain things they become sensitive to the creation they hear stories about am Yisrael that are difficult they start crying hysterical how many stories are there about Ravovadia or any of the other gedolei adol crying about people they've never met before hearing about the tragedies that they're going through the difficulties they're going through and simply crying hysterically more than they would cry as if one of their family members died crying hysterical and it's they become really sensitive why the more of a tummy the more they're open the more they're sensitive to the things that are around them much more than a person that's closed whereas a person that is not aware of all of these things they become actually desensitized they could see two people fist fighting and just watch it yeah yeah hit them go go yeah punch them kick them kick them for you know it they may even join the fight just for some action whereas if you see a tummy come see such a thing they may start crying scenes to, to two people do such a thing now again not all Tamid Chachamim are alike, not all Tamid Chachamim are as sensitive, but nonetheless, this is what he's talking about. And the more a person refines their soul, softens, softens their soul, the more they make themselves a vessel to receive this truth of the Torah. And part of the requirements to refine a person's soul, the Chazoni says, is to rise above the desires of the mortal human beings this is one of the tools that is the fast forward button for a person that wants to get high level of kedusha if a person wants to get to a high level of holiness she wants to get to a high level of holiness he wants to get to a high level of holiness this is what the secret is overcoming those desires you have a desire for people to look at you bingo become more modest you have a desire to uh to to eat a lot of food bingo eat less eat on a specific schedule perhaps even consider taking a fast once a month you have a desire to do certain things that's it use those desires as tools that you could overcome them in order to reach higher level of kedusha now again don't go too much don't start fasting twice a week when you just started keeping shabbat six months ago but the point is that overcoming those desires is how a person becomes holier and holier the more he overcomes those desires the more holy he becomes now again everybody has basic needs no one is telling you not to fulfill your basic needs but there's a difference between a need and a desire the uh um malacha magid that uh was the chavruta the angel that was a chavruta to rabbi yosef karo he writes in the magid mesharim that uh, one time he uh comes to uh rabbi yosef karo and he says you see i have not come to you in a few days do you know why and Rabbi Yosef Karo, Kodesh Kodeshim, says, No, I don't know why. He says, It's because I saw that when you drank water, you drank it with desire to the point where you drank more than you needed. And once I saw that this is where you're at, I couldn't even look at you. I, had, I couldn't come to you. Couldn't come to you. Now, of course, no one is telling you not to drink water. No one is telling you not to fulfill your basic needs. But the tzaddik, Rabbi Yosef Kao, is already at such a high level that an angel was his chavuta studying with him every day. 
So just gives you the idea of where we're at here. And he's telling him, listen, you want me to come to you every day. You have to meet a certain requirement. What's a requirement? You cannot even drink water to fulfill a desire. Only to meet your basic needs. You're thirsty, you drink what you need. Not more. Why? Because you're at that level that you have an angel being your chavuta. The, uh, one of the gedolei ado today is Rav Mazuz. Rav Mazuz, Rav Meir Mazuz, his father was also one of the gedolei ado, Rav Matzliach Mazuz. All of his life, Rav Matzliach Mazuz, all of his life, he never drank a cold cup of water. Never in his life. When they asked him, for the Rav, do you like cold water? He says, no. Regular room temperature water. Why? He says, because the cold part, it's just, a, it's like tava, it's just a desire. Just a desire. What do I need this desire for? So from now on, I'm going to start desiring cold water. For what? Better not to have it. In his whole life, he limited his desires even not to drink a cold cup of water. Again, these are not recommendations for anybody. This is not what I do. This is not what I'm recommending for you to do. But it's just to understand the what is the tzaddikim? What are they doing? And how they got to that point. Of course, they didn't start with such things. They started with smaller things and built themselves up. But of course, all of it was built on Torah, Yirat Shamaim, and then little by little with other things. The key is to understand is that when a person wants to get to a highest level of Kedusha, they're admiring the Gdolei Adol, they're admiring these big Tzadikim, they have to know these are not people that functioned like you and me. They're not functioning like regular people. They're building themselves on a regular basis. More Torah, more fear of heaven, more Torah, more fear of heaven. More, 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 more. That's, the, their, that's what becomes their desire. And they replace all of the regular desires of people with desires to serve Hashem. The Chazonish continues. And he says, there's no wisdom of Torah without one's intellectual abilities merging with a sense of fear of sin. This combination is the desired state of the Torah scholar all of his life. Indeed, Torah and fear of heaven are like matter and shape, which together make up material reality. Whoever is not protected, whoever is not perfected, his fear of heaven, even if his powers of thinking are sharp and polished by nature, will not merit to possess the complete Torah. For his view will be full of obstacles and deviations from the truth. So here the Chazonish gives us an atomic bomb, which we already discussed, but he, now it's in his words. In so many words, if a person has a natural ability, they have a good memory, they uh, like to learn, and they learn Torah. But if they're not constantly working on their fear of the Almighty, that wisdom, that knowledge, is not going to be something that they can rely on. It's not going to be something that's going to make them a true Torah scholar. Why? Because they have to merge their fear of heaven with their intellectual abilities, with their Torah scholarship, to the point where they could sense the fear of heaven. What does it mean to sense the fear of heaven? In Hebrew, it's tam. Tam yiratachet is more like taste of the fear of heaven, which in essence is the same thing. Taste is one of the senses. What does it mean to taste the fear of heaven, to sense the fear of heaven? A person needs to get to a point where they sense the fear of heaven. What does that really mean? One of the gdolei ado in the previous generation the Rashash, the, uh, the uh, Rashash was the Yemenite Rashash, uh, Rabbi Shalom uh, uh, Shabazi. He was a uh, extraordinary Talmud Chacham, 
that uh, there's no end to the stories that are told about him in the Torah that he has. And one of the uh, things I heard from my Rav, or Ephraim, is that when he was young, he was a, uh, he used to sell different odds and ends, different things. He would go to different people's houses, show them what he has, and sell it to them. He was a younger guy, he was a beautiful person, both spiritually and physically, with the peot, beautiful uh, uh, skin, like Yosef Tzadik. Now, this Tzadik, this Rashash, one time he went to a person's house, and uh, this uh, Arab woman opens the door, and uh, she sees this beautiful Jew, she says, come, come, come inside. My husband's going to come in a moment. So the Rashash comes in. And as soon as he comes in, she says, oh, yeah, just go in there. She tells him where to go, some room. He's thinking that he's going into an office to go meet the husband. As soon as he comes in, she goes inside, smashes the, uh, the door closed, shuts it, and takes the key, locks him in the key. And she says... Now, I want you to be with me. And she's enticing him to sin. This Tmea, this impure Arab woman, wants the Rashash to sleep with her. Now, this young man, this beautiful kid, what's he going to do? On one end, you have a situation here where he knows that anything he says, she could be like Potiphar's wife and end up getting him thrown to jail at the best case scenario and killed in the worst case scenario. On the other end, it's a sin. It's a, it's a biblical sin. So he says, okay, no problem. Just please, I need to go to use the uh, bathroom for a second. And then after I finish, whatever you want. So sure, right there. He goes into the bathroom and he sees the bathroom has a small little window and he fits pokes out his head out the window and he sees he's two stories up he goes through the window jumps two stories and only by a miracle only by a miracle did he actually survive the fall without hurting himself or even killing himself because of the way he fell, he couldn't like position himself to jump with his feet or anything like that. A much miracle. And as soon as he got down, he said one of the holy names of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and did something called Kfitzat Aderech, which put him, took him from Yemen all the way to Eretz Yisrael, where over there he built the Yeshivat Mekubalim, very famous Yeshiva of, 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 of Mekubalim. And that's where he built it. So the question is, why didn't he use Hashem's holy name, if he already knows enough to get him to transfer him from one country to another in a second, it's no planes, no, uh, no uh, spaceships, nothing. In one second he was able to use this holy name which, to transfer him from one country to another, fleeing any persecution that he knows is going to happen for the accusations this wicked woman is going to put on him for fleeing from her. So he did the right thing, he flee. But why didn't he use this name to jump out of the window? Instead of jumping out of the window, just use the name to go from there. Ephraim says, that's Tam Achit. That's Tam Tam Yirah. That is the Tam Yirah. That is the taste of the, uh, the fear. Meaning, if you hear about Kafakela, all these scary things. Okay, could be scared, could be petrified even, perhaps even crying. A desire comes, most likely it'll stop you. Stop you from fulfilling that desire as long as you continue learning. So you have some recollection of what fear of heaven is. You have some recollection of consequences. But it's not the same as if you walk into a room and the first thing you see is a hungry lion. 
looking at you and ready to jump on you. That's a completely different fear. That fear you can taste. That fear you can taste. Most people, you can tell them about all types of things and genome and this and that. They're scared, but some people, not so scared. But if you tell them, are you scared of cancer? Are you scared of ISIS, terrorists, blowing up buildings? Are you scared of hurricanes? Are you scared of bankruptcy? Those they're scared of. Rabbi, why are you cursing me? No, I'm not cursing. I'm just asking if you're scared of cancer. You're scared that just one day there's going to be a little cell in your brain that doesn't work. I'm just asking you if you're scared of that. Because a lot of cells in your head. I'm not telling you all the cells don't work. Just one cell in your brain doesn't work. Just start for a little bit. It's called the brain aneurysm. Just one little blood clot. Blood doesn't travel. One thing. You scared of that? Scared of cancer? One cell just continues to grow endlessly? You scared of that? You scared of having all of these deadly diseases? You scared of some terrorist, some, some uh, ISIS member showing up chopping off heads next to you? You scared of that? Scared of a world war, you're scared of terrorism, you're scared of bankruptcy, the whole market crashes, any market and every market. You're scared of those things, those you're scared of. A lot more than you're scared of the place that you heard about in the lecture because you never saw it. Because those things, you saw them in one way or another, in movies or in reality, in news. So it makes you more scared. So for those things you have, the taste, the sense of fear. For the genome and the other things, not so much. That's where you need to switch. That's where you need to switch. The Rashash, he understood the, the, the significance of a sin to the point where even using Kabbalah Ma'asit that he had available to him at any moment that he used moments later even that escaped him because of how scared he was of the sin not of a lion not of ISIS not of uh, a great depression or cancer but of a sin that's how scared he was of a sin that he simply was willing to die instead of sinning jumping out of a two-story building just to avoid sinning with an impure, beautiful woman that's not his wife and not even Jewish. Refused. Why? Petrified of the sin. That's tasting the sin. That's sensing the sin. That's, in essence, the goal that we should all have to reach one day. To taste the sin to that extent to be scared of it but not, I'm scared of going to uh, gain normal, getting killed by ISIS or, or some other terrorist. No, that's, yeah, that's where we all start. But that's not the fear that the Rashash had. His fear was of the sin itself. Why? Because that sin will separate me from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That sin will make me not the person that I need to be. The servant that I need to be. The Rashash was so scared of going against Hashem that even the tools that he had available to him, Torah tools, didn't even think about using them. Why? There's a lion in front of me. Who has time to think about these things? You just have to jump. You just have to jump. That's what the Chazonish is in essence telling us here is that no wisdom of Torah without a person's intellectual ability merging with the taste of sin taste of uh, taste of fear meaning that again may not have to uh, necessarily reach the level of the rashas but the point is that person needs to become more sensitive to the uh, to the sins and be much more afraid of sinning in order for that person's intellectual abilities and his Torah knowledge to really come to life because this combination is what a Torah scholar is desires his whole life because he knows that 
while Torah and fear of heaven are like matter and shape, to, together they make a reality. That's what makes the Torah scholar a Torah scholar, that combination of the two. And whoever has not perfected this fear of heaven, even if he has natural abilities, power of thinking, he's a bright person, he's sharp, he's an extraordinary memory, he's polished by nature, he still will not merit to possess the complete Torah. He can remember the entire Shas by heart. He's still not going to have the real Torah. He still looks at a page and he sees the wrong answer. He still evaluates something, he cannot arrive at the truth. Simply not possible for him to arrive at the truth. There was a certain Jew that came to a rabbi in Eretz Yisrael, and a Russian Jew, and uh, told him, Rabbi, I want to learn Gemara. You want to teach me Gemara? Rabbi said, sure, of course, why not? He said, okay, but it has to be in my conditions. Okay, what's your conditions? He says, one, I'm not circumcised. And I don't want to hear about it. Don't ask me to get circumcised. Okay. Number two, I'm married to a non-Jew. The rabbi said, okay, let me ask my Rav. He went to Rav Steinemann, especially for this, to find out the answer to I mean, this guy, obviously, is a difficult case. He's already coming in. He says he wants to learn Torah. He wants to learn Gemara, nonetheless. But he has these issues. And he's not even willing to hear the truth about them. He's not even willing to do tshuva for them. Nothing. Is it even worth it to teach such a person? Of Steinemann says, yes. But teach him, Masechet Baba Metzia. said, okay, fine. He starts teaching him Masechet Baba Metzia. All types of issues regarding to business. The guy's very bright. Has a sharp head. And little by little, he's learning, learning. And before you know it, he tells the rabbi, I left my wife. The non-Jew, I left her. Rabbi is very happy. Baruch Hashem. Then they get to later on into the Gemara, and they continue learning, learning. And they get to a famous sugya in Masechet Baba Metzia, page 47. Mishnah over there talks about all types of uh, business dealings. In essence, this whole sugya is very mathematical. It's all math. Rabbi teaches him the Gemara. Guy doesn't get it. Tries again. Doesn't get it. Okay, you know what? Maybe you're tired today. Come back tomorrow. We'll learn again. Okay, the guy comes back the next day. They go over the same sugya again. Still doesn't understand what the rabbi is talking about. They've been learning together for months. So far, everything is good. But they get to this. Nothing. Doesn't understand what the rabbi is saying, no matter how he says it. So he thinks, all right, maybe the rabbi is not explaining it well. Let me go to a different rabbi. He goes to a different rabbi. Two o'clock in the uh, morning, there's uh, some other Tamidah Chamim that are studying somewhere over there in Yerushalayim. He goes over there, he sees there's people there, he says, listen, I want to learn, can you teach me this? Sure, why not? Sees a guy, looks like a Baal Tshuva, wants to learn Gemara at 2 o'clock in the morning, why not? Says, okay. They start sitting, he teaches him the Gemara, the guy doesn't understand, does not understand. He says to himself, after trying hard for two weeks, he's trying to learn this Gemara, nothing, nothing, nothing. He cannot understand it, it's killing him. Try it with different rabbis, try it in different ways, try it in the morning, try it at night. It's not working, he simply cannot understand it. And then he gets to a conclusion himself, he said, maybe because I'm not circumcised, Maybe my brain just simply can't handle such a thing. He decided for himself, you know what? Either way, I got to get circumcised. I'm going to live a Jewish life. And he decides, he tells the rabbi. The rabbi is very happy. He connects him with some uh, organization in Eretz Israel that helps 
different people that are adults get circumcision. And Baruch uh, Hashem, he gets circumcised. The day of his circumcision, he says to the rabbi, please rabbi, I want to learn that Gemara again. They learn that Gemara. He understands it like the back of his hand. Everything he understands. Everything is clear. They're both happy. They're both celebrating. And the rabbi says to him, I want you to come with me. I want you to want to go see Rav Steinemann. I want you to meet Rav Steinemann with me. The guy is excited. Let's go. See one of the Gedolei Ado. They come. They get to pray next to Rav Steinemann. And then the Rav has a Kabbalat Ka'al. He uh, sees people. And then he sees the rabbi and his Talmud. And immediately Rav Steinemann starts smiling. His face is lighting up. So happy to see this guy. And the guy says to him, Rav, can I ask you some questions about this specific Marai and Baba Metziah? The rabbi says, of course. And they start toiling back and forth. Hey, my Rav Steinemann, back and forth. This, but this, but that, but do, 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 do. After he finished talking, Rav Steinemann says to the guy, so you got the Brit Mila, didn't you? The guy was shocked. The rabbi was shocked because they never told him. He said, how does the rabbi know? Steinemann says, because we have a tradition. We have a Masoret. Only a Jew can understand that particular Gemara. That particular sugya, only a Jew can understand it. To be a Jew, you have to be circumcised. You were not, you were not going to be able to understand such a Gemara if you weren't circumcised. They go, the rabbi and the student are amazed. They go to Rav Kanievsky, Shichye. They tell him the story. And Rav Kanievsky smiles and says, Yeah, sure, there's that Masoret, but also you could just see it on his face. People that are extremely holy see different things on different faces. But the point being is, is that when a person when a person is constantly searching for the truth, they know that they have to overcome certain desires. They know that they have to overcome certain things. And if they do, they succeed. But if their fear of heaven is simply not existent, or is just, they're not interested in increasing it, they're not in- interested in developing it, that Torah knowledge that they have is being limited by them, by their own hands. They can learn more books, but it won't give them more Torah. They can memorize more things, but it won't give them more Torah. Real Torah knowledge is gifted by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is why in the beginning of every Gemara, the inner page, the inner cover, has a few verses in there. It's tradition, tradition to say a few of these verses before you uh, start learning Gemara, and a few of these verses after you complete learning Gemara for that day. And what you say in a, uh, when you first start learning Gemara, before you start learning, is that what? The verse that Shlomo HaMelech taught us, Hashem gives knowledge. Hashem gives the wisdom. You don't just uh, read a bunch of books, and therefore you acquire Torah. You may be able to acquire other knowledge. You may be able to acquire great things, physics and uh and and all types of other sciences and mathematics and languages and even basic understandings of torah but true torah the essence of it is gifted to a person it's gifted to a person even the midrash says Moshe Rabbeinu studied Chavruta with HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself 40 days 40 nights at the end of 40 days and 40 nights Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, I forgot everything. He learned the whole Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu learned a Torah that we don't have. We, what we were given by HaKadosh Baruch Hu was the essence of Torah. What HaKadosh Baruch Hu taught Moshe is the Torah itself. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, I forgot it. Learning with you day and night, not eating, not sleeping, not drinking, 40 days, 40 nights, forgot everything. Try it again. 40 days, 40 nights, forgot everything. 
Three times Moshe Rabbeinu was in Shemaim, 40 days, 40 nights. And each time he's forgetting everything. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, here you go. And he gives him the Torah. He gives him the Torah. You tried. Now I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. When a person tries to acquire Torah simply because of their mental prowess, simply because they feel, ah, this is good to have on my resume. They may be able to have certain superficial knowledge, certain stories, certain basics, but real Torah, they will not have. And that's where the Chazonish finishes off this section by saying the following. As our sages said, such a person is not able to arrive at the truth, at the true ruling in a case. For the inner light that accompanies the light of the intellect, smoothing out all the creases and allowing one to reach the refined truth is pure fear of heaven. Whoever lacks that fear is lacking the feeling of refinement of the soul and the taste of the glory of heavenly wisdom. His brain lacks the power to differentiate between truth and falsehood. And in spite of his wisdom, he will err in all his judgments. In so many words, Rabotai Karim, when a person does not continuously develop their fear of the Almighty, they cannot become more sensitive to the Almighty and His creations. When a person is not sensitive to the Almighty and His creations, he cannot acquire real Torah. And therefore, they can live an entire life not being able to know the difference between truth and falsehood. And they could be a Christian pastor that knows the entire Old Testament, what they call the Old Testament, the five books of Moses. They know the entire thing by heart and all the prophets and the writings. They know the whole thing by heart and still not understand that serving Yoshke is idol worship. Still not know that Hashem is one and only one. There is no other. There is nobody else. There is no pieces. They know the whole thing by heart, but they're still an idol worshiper. The guy could know the entire Chumash by heart because he learned in a yeshiva and everything else and still drive on Shabbat. Or be like this guy that I heard from Rav Zev who used to learn Gemara on Shabbat while smoking a cigarette. A person that does not continuously develop their sensitivities to a Shemini's creation by developing their fear of the Almighty, no matter what wisdom they have, natural inclinations Hashem gifted them, they'll never have the true Torah, meaning they will never be able to decipher the real difference between truth and falsehood she can say i'm religious and i sell mother's clothes while she herself looks and acts like a zona she can feel like she is a victim in reality she's the perpetrator he can feel like he is helping society in reality he is a predator a pedophile, a, a, a destroyer of souls. They don't even know the difference between right and wrong because everything is based on their own understanding, their own definitions, their own desires, their own wants, their own needs, their own ability. And there's a reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us in the uh, book of Deuteronomy, Parashat Ekev, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, after you eat, bless me. I'm going to give you food. I'm going to satiate you. And the very following verse he says, well, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you all the blessings and all the sustenance, don't forget him. What does one thing have to do with the other? If you just fed me, if you just gave me sustenance, you just gave me blessings, why are you f- giving me a mitzvah? Not to forget God. Because that 
is the natural inclination of the Yetzirah of each person. As we learn in Parashat Bereshit, everyone has a Yetzirah Tov, Yetzirah. Good inclination, bad inclination, evil inclination. When a person toils and toils in Torah, they're developing their good inclination to be in line with HaKadosh Baruch Hu at all times. And by defeating their evil inclination. When a person does not learn Torah, then their good inclination simply quiets more, more, more to the point of non-existence. It's there, but only u- utilized superficially. So what's utilized? The default of each and every person, both Jew and Gentile, is the evil inclination. Meaning, the inclination that's against Hashem, the inclination that's the resistance that is there to make your good deeds worthwhile. Meaning that the the Satan, the evil inclination is there to be the resistance between you and fulfilling Hashem's will. Why? Because if there's a resistance if there's a resistance on the way to fulfilling Hashem's will and you overcome that resistance, then your effort is worthwhile. It's, it's valuable. But if there's no resistance, then obviously why, why, is, why are you going to get rewarded for something that there's no resistance? Just like if there was, let's say, a net and somebody hit, uh, you know, kicked the ball into the net. If there's no goalie and nobody trying to stop the ball, it's not really a big deal. You just kick the ball into the net over and over again. No one's going to clap for you. Why? It's not a big deal. There's nobody. There's no resistance. But if there's a goalie, there's somebody trying to stop the ball, and on top of it is other players, you could even get millions and millions of dollars just because you could kick the ball into the, uh, into the net because there's a resistance. The same exact goes with the evil inclination. That evil inclination's job is to be the resistance between you and fulfilling the will of Hashem, thereby giving you a value for those good deeds but when you're not kicking the ball into the heavenly court when you're not trying to fulfill the will of Hashem you're not trying to get to where Hashem wants you to be all you have is the resistance and the resistance being your natural default will just constantly take you to places that Hashem doesn't want you to be in and one of those places is ungratefulness where after hashem gives you all of the sustenance that you want and after kadosh baruch Hu gives you the wife or the husband that you want and after kadosh baruch Hu gives you the children that you want and after kadosh baruch Hu gives you all of the wonderful things that you want instead of saying thank you kadosh baruch Hu, i love you i'm gonna do more of what you told me because you give me things even if i don't deserve them what do you do you say look at what i've built look at what i did you what do you mean you you made that cell turn into a baby you made that idea turn into millions of dollars you what did you do what do you mean i did it what about hashem yeah 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 hashem hashem you forget hashem that's why kadosh says after i give you all of the blessings please don't forget me because that's your natural inclination to forget a kadosh Hu, dafka after he gives you the blessings Meaning that the more a person gets blessings from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the more they should remember Hashem. But it's the opposite here. Why? If you don't already have HaKadosh Baruch Hu in your life before you got the blessings, if you don't recognize Hashem before you got the blessings, surely you will not recognize Him after the blessings which is the opposite of what people think people think well if hashem gave me this gave me that gave me that i'll become more religious no it's the opposite of the torah torah says after i give you this you're more inclined to forget hashem hence the reason why usually poor people are the most religious people they're the closest to hashem because the ones that get the gifts unfortunately they're not close enough to hashem 
to really know the truth, to fight against the desires, and they default to their evil inclination and end up forgetting Hashem due to the blessing that He gives them. And that's why Kadosh Baruch Hu sometimes does not bless us. Why? Because He knows it's actually not a blessing, but rather a curse. But Sisira Botaya Karim, Kadosh Baruch Hu keeps giving us chances. He tries again and again. Okay, let me give them more money. Maybe this time she will give tzedakah. Let me give them more money. Let, this time he'll give masel. Let me give them more time. Maybe this time they'll do tshuva. Let me give them this. Maybe they'll do this. Let me give them that. Maybe they'll do this. And he gives us more and more and more chances. And instead of getting close to Hashem, what do we do? We become soldiers of the Satan. How? Simply not caring. Simply not caring. By simply not caring enough about the consequences of our actions, we become desensitized to Hashem to the point where we don't recognize Him in anything. You can see a person give an entire thank you speech for some achievement that he feels or she feels they did without mentioning Hashem even a single time. You can see people literally bring a child to the world without even recognizing that Hashem made this happen. You can see people literally be gifted endless things without them even recognizing that Hashem is the one that decided it for them. She thinks that she did it. He thinks that he did it. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you see, I gave you what you wanted and even more. And what'd you do? You forgot me. You forgot me. How could a person avoid such an ungrateful status? Simple. Work on it before the gift. Work on it before the blessing. Work on knowing what the law is and combine it with fear of the Almighty. Fear of sinning. Fear of sinning and distancing yourself from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because the greatest thing you can possibly ever give yourself is closeness to Hashem. But superficial closeness to Hashem that's just based on superficial knowledge, that's not based on reward and punishment, that's not based on the truth, that knowledge is not going to be enough. If you just know the basics of the law, it's not going to be enough to stop you from sinning. You can go know the basics of the law of Shabbat, but that's not, it's not going to make you modest. You can know the laws of modesty, but that's not going to necessarily make you fear the Almighty when it comes to intermarriage or promiscuity. You can know the laws of intermarriage and promiscuity and Shabbat and everything else and still violate all of them. Why? Because you figured that Hashem knows that you are having a difficult time and because of that, you can't keep. Meaning, knowledge of the law does not necessarily give you the strength to fight the desire of violating the law. But the fear, the fear of the sin, by knowing the consequences, the ramifications of your action, if you violate this relationship, she or he is going to leave you. If you violate this relationship, you can get arrested. You can lose your, your freedom. If you violate this relationship, it can cause endless embarrassment, cancer, death, tragedy, horrible. There's a lot of, lot of consequences. When you know that consequences for violating that law, automatically, that makes you more capable of overcoming that desire. Now, of course, you need to know the law exists in the first place in order to know what not to violate. But once you have that combination, you become more sensitive to things that not only violate the law, but also things that can entice you to violate the law, that come close to violating the law. You become more sensitive. And the more sensitive you are to all of this, you also become more sensitive to Hashem in general. And you start seeing Hashem's greatness in everything. You're not just walking around scared all the time. You're also walking around enlightened all the time. You see how HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ishtabach Shimolad even though I haven't reached even a fraction of a fraction of where I need to be, he still gave me a few beautiful kids. 
He still gave me a beautiful spouse. He still gave me parnasa bekavod. I don't have to beg anybody. He still gave me health. He still gave me this. He, look how much he's given me. Shtabach shimolad. Look at that. He gave me a sunny day. He gave me a rainy day. He gave me this. He gave me that. And you start seeing Hashem everywhere. You start seeing Hashem everywhere. And you start singing. You start singing to Ribbono Olam. Why? Because you feel him. You feel a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You've left the lie. And you've arrived at the truth. You're no longer in the middle. If you're not feeling Hashem, that means you're still living either in the world of lies or in the world that's between the lies and the truth. To know that you're in the truth, you have to feel Hashem. Feel Hashem. Sing to Hashem. Know that Hashem is there no matter what the picture looks like. When a person knows that Hashem is there, not only is he scared to sin because there's consequences of punishment, but he's scared to ruin that closeness. He's scared to ruin that relationship. He's scared to ruin that feeling that he or she feels that a Kadosh Bahu is hugging them even when it hurts. He's crying with them. Together, we both cry. When a person knows that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is with them, there is no greater fear in the world than the fear to lose that feeling. I wish for all of us to arrive at that feeling because that is a real achievement. Bezat Hashem will continue learning more and more what our sages want to teach us in order to give us the map to arrive at what the truth really is and what the ashkafa, the mindset, the ideology that we're supposed to have really is supposed to look like. And as we get closer and closer to it, you'll start feeling that you're already there. Because Bezad Hashem, you will be. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen Amen. אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, ודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן, קהילה ספרדית גדולה.